Good morning everyone, welcome back to my tutors online school and welcome back to English. So today we are just rounding up paper two, essentially we're back on the English language and I'm going to run through all of the questions, give you some tips, tricks, sort of a little bit like what I was doing when we were doing four sessions a week, where I was sort of doing a mini roundup of each of the questions. So essentially that's what you're getting today. Um, I'm not going to throw any new texts at you as such, um, but I'm going to sort of show you how to plan what sort of techniques you can use in the exam and um, I'm going to show you a load of resources which I think might be helpful for your revision. Um, some of them are paid resources, um, there's the odd few bits that are free as well so I'm going to do my best to sort of show you around some websites um, which I think you guys might find helpful. Um, so as usual we'll do about 45 minutes teaching um, but I'm going to sort of uh, be quite flexible today in terms of answering questions. So today is the day for you to answer, for me to answer any of your questions for paper two, because um, we are essentially finishing the, it off today. So if there's anything that you're concerned about, you're worried about across any of the questions, I'm gonna run through all five of them. So I'm gonna quickly look at question one again, uh, which we haven't done before. Um, so absolutely anything at all, give me a, shout so I can answer them and um, sort of see how the 45 minutes teaching goes and how the Q&A goes. We've got a couple of cahoots for you guys today um, so we'll just um, sort of uh, play it by ear essentially. So if you guys don't know me, uh, my name's Vicky, uh, I did English lang language and linguistics at undergrad, did my PGCE in English last year and I've taught about 306 eight lessons I think on my tutor at the moment so that is me but I'm sure all of you know by now I'm fed up of seeing that slide right so how to ace paper two then I personally think paper two is more difficult than paper one mainly because of the amount of text you've got to tackle so with this one you've got two sources the first one you've only got one source I think generally they are kinder um, in how they lay them out in the exams for your uh, paper one, which I will show you what I mean in a minute. Um, so this is really handy. If you type into Google um, AQA GCSE uh, English language timings, uh, this cute little PDF pops up, which I think is really nice. I really like it. So um, it tells you the timings of what you should be spending on each one. Really nice, really visual. Um, so, you've got 15 minutes at the start, which they suggest you just do uh, reading and planning. So, I think this is really interesting with what you do with planning, what you're going to be planning for in that 15 minutes. So, here you can see you've got five minutes to plan your question four. So, this essentially is anything to do with planning for question one, two and three. Question one is a tick box exercise, it's a true or false. Um, so that probably shouldn't take, you won't need to plan for it, that should be pretty straightforward. Um, so that's time essentially for you to be planning for your question two, question three, reading over the sources really carefully. And then for your writing you've got 45 minutes, so five minutes to plan and then five minutes to read through at the end. Make sure that you proofread and you haven't made any silly mistakes and then you've got 35 minutes to actually do your writing. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be working backwards so I'm going to be starting from question five so I'm going to be starting effectively um, at the end and working backwards because uh, the meatier questions are at the end so I'm going to be doing bigger questions going um, backwards essentially. So first things first let me just check what you guys have popped in got a lovely few of you people just saying hello to me this morning which is really sweet thank you very much right okay so coat I've got exam questions two or throw false so most of these I threw at you guys a while ago um, but I've added a few more in as well so hopefully I'm going to find out some of your misconceptions so I can clear those up for you guys so I'll post the game pin in the chat and what are we on kahoot.it for some of you to get on 
Right, so how many have we got this morning? We've got 29 of you lovely people. So let's get you popping on. You can just use something anonymous if you don't want me to know your name. That's absolutely fine. I really don't mind. As long as you have a go. So as I said, most of these you will have seen before. Um, but there was a few misconceptions, so I'm going to see one if you guys can remember for those. If not, I will sort of clear things up for you guys. Um, and there's, I think I've added four more on, um, which weren't on there last time. So you've got a little bit of an extension. So 12 questions on this one, rather than I think we did eight last time. So we've got half of you on. So I think we will get cracking and other people can jump on as uh, we go. Right, okay. So you should plan every answer. Sort of already given you the answer to that one, bit of a giveaway. Yes, so bit of a tricksy one. So you have 15 minutes to plan at the start, which I've just shown you guys. Um, but you don't need to be planning for your question one because you're just tick boxing. Your question two and three, you've got a little bit of planning time, but it is really quite small once you've read everything. So yeah, that one is false. Caught some of you out. So paper one and paper two language analysis questions are worth the same amount of marks. So I will give you a hint, paper one, question two is the language features and paper one question, paper two, question three is the language features. That helps you. Yep, so um, paper one is worth eight and paper two is worth 12. So really you need another paragraph on um, that one. You can talk about any language features in paper two, question three. Yep, you can. It's uh, completely up to you. As long as it's there, you can talk about it. So that also includes sentence forms as well. It is important to link your points together if possible. Yeah, absolutely. If you can make them flow really nicely, um, that is even better. I'm allowed to give a personal response in my writing. So that could be for, oh, actually, I might not say anything. I might be quiet. So you are allowed to, so really the only one questions you will be doing that for are questions two, three and four, the um, reading comprehension questions, essentially. Um, but you can say this makes me feel, I tend to say that this makes the reader feel just because I like it to be a bit impersonal. I will get extra marks if I use additional pieces of evidence outside the specified lines. So that means um, source, for this question you must focus on source A lines 10 to 20, for example. Yep, so some people get confused and think they'll get extra marks from that. It's not the case. We can't give you any credit for it, even if what you write is fantastic, um, which is a shame, so don't do it. Paper two, question three requires me to consider structure. Excuse me. Oh, right. Yes. So it's all language devices, uh, features, techniques. You can talk about sentence forms. It's not a structure question. We don't have a structure question. 
in this one. The writing tasks are worth the same amount of marks as the reading comprehensions put together. Oh, right. Yeah. OK, so they are the same. So questions one, two, three and four are worth 40 marks and question five is worth 40 marks. So they're both worth 25 percent of your overall um, grade. You must use evidence to support your answers in all the questions on paper, too. wondering how many of you I've caught out on this one yeah so uh, you don't need to use evidence for question five because it's creative writing knowing 19th century context will help you in this exam I know this isn't a maths lesson it is English Yeah, so it would be really good if you know a bit of context and I'm going to give you some resources to go sort of have a little dig around at um, for that. Knowing a little bit is good. Don't worry about knowing the entire time period and knowing the ins and outs of it doesn't matter. Once you're allocated time for each question is passed, you should move on. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got the odd student who will spend a really long time on uh, one question, which isn't worth a huge amount of marks. Um, so, yeah, moving on, even if you think you could write more, just be careful with your timings. Last one, you should answer the questions in order. Yep, you can do it any way that you like. So following up a little bit then, I'll say in a minute actually once we look at the podium. So Louise at third. Is that square minus one? I love that. Square root. Is it square root? And then Matthew at first. Well done. Cracking. Right, okay, so what was I going to say? Um, yes, yeah, so in terms of questions, you can answer them in any order that you like. It doesn't matter. Um, I've got one person who um, struggles a little bit with his timings, um, or did have a person that struggled with his timings. Um, so what we did was we said work backwards in the paper, so, which is what I'm doing today. So start with your big 40 marker, because that's probably where you're going to get the most marks and then work back so with this one with your 16 marker then your 12 then your 8 then your 4 so if you run it out of time at the end and perhaps you've only done three questions you've missed out a potential 12 marks rather than not doing the big uh, writing one where you've lost out on 40 marks so you can work backwards or do them in different orders you can do them any way that you want um, but if you are someone who struggles to finish a paper then perhaps working backwards might help um, or perhaps just doing the writing and then going to the start of the reading and working your way through. Um, whatever works for you, perhaps have a go at a few practice papers uh, with a clock next to you and work out which way you think works best. And then you sort of got a game plan for when you go into the exam. But there's um, no right or wrong way in which questions you answer first, essentially. Um, right. Oh, it says that, OK, on the timetable, it's meant to be a maths lesson and English later on during the day. Right. So I think that's probably an error in the timetabling uh, because English is always on at this time. Um, so I'm not in charge of uh, the website, the timetabling um, 
and um, all of the stuff you see on the website I just come and teach you sessions um, so I'm really sorry if you've got confused um, and I will flag it up to um, the my tutor office um, to make sure that it's sorted out essentially right okay let's get cracking question five so you've got 45 minutes for this one five minutes to plan at the start and five minutes to check so I've got for each of these the um, assessment objectives that we are going to be looking at um, so assessment five so content and organization so basically making sure that your text makes sense it's nice and easy to read it flows you're using a lot of um, language devices um, and then here it says adapting tone style and register for different forms and uh, using structural and grammatical features so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what on earth those mean um, because I think they're quite tricky um, and then your AO6 is your spag marks so um, using advanced vocabulary and spelling it correctly making sure your sentence structures make sense your punctuation is the right in the right place you're using as much punctuation as possible one of my students mentioned to me yesterday that um, he was told that use as much punctuation as you can think of that you can remember that you know how to use well which is quite I think a really good uh, piece of advice um, so that would be a good place to start so just getting him a question mark and an exclamation mark and perhaps learning how to use a semicolon and a colon or just a semicolon if you're sort of a bit unsure of colons um, that would be great and then you've got full stops and commas which you will put in automatically as well you could put in the old quotation mark because what's really nice with question five is that you can include facts and opinions so you could just quickly ram a quotation in there and that would tick that box off so I think this one is slightly easier for using different uh, pieces of punctuation um, than uh, your paper one. Whereas if you're using speech marks, then you've got a whole load of rules that are using dialogue and how they work, um, which can get really tricky and complicated. Hence why I'm sure some of your teachers have said don't use dialogue because there's a lot that could potentially go wrong and you'll lose some spag marks if you don't do it spot on. Right okay so question then you will get some sort of statement so this is a past question paper cars are noisy dirty smelly and downright dangerous they should be banned from all towns and city centers allowing people to walk and cycle in peace so you'll get some sort of quotation it won't be really really inflammatory so it won't be something like um this person thinks that capital punishment should uh, be brought back or should be banned across the entire world or uh, something about abortion or something about feminism um, or racism anything along those lines it won't be anything that is a really huge topic that there's so much that you could potentially talk about it will be usually something quite mundane and something that is usually relevant to you guys this one isn't particularly um, but it's quite uh, wouldn't be surprised if you got anything on homework I think there was a past paper that mentions homework anything like extracurricular activities anything to do with um, sort of parenting um in relationship to teenagers though those sorts of things is essentially what you're going to have thrown at you right so in terms of what sort of text you might be asked to write um you could be asked to write a letter a newspaper article a leaflet speech or essay now as far as i can see there was november 2019 which i couldn't find on the internet um, but I found uh, June 2019. So far, no one's been asked to write an essay and no one's been asked to write a leaflet. Um, so potentially those could be coming up, but um, these are what have come up so far. So that the, I think the one that I've just shown you, uh, which was the letter to Minister of Transport. So that one was uh, 2018, June 2018. There's been just write a newspaper article. There's been write a speech uh, to for an assembly in front of your teachers and peers. Um, there have been two broadsheet broadsheet newspaper articles and one magazine article. So probably you're you're going to be writing an article, but I'd say probably in the next load of GCSEs, um, I would say probably a speech will come up, maybe a leaflet. Um, 
but they're all very, very similar. Um, you will be using almost all the ingredients that you've already got behind you, essentially. All of the deforest features, you can use any of them in any of these pieces of writing. Uh, anything like bias, credibility, validity, um, generalizations, jargon, you could use any of those, this sort of higher stretch terminology I've been working on with you guys, um, you could use any of those as well. Um, it's just how you adapt your style essentially. So um, you will be given on each of these a purpose, an audience and a format. So your purpose is to um, argue, so arguing your point of view. So purpose arguing and maybe secondary to persuade. Uh, your format is a letter and your audience is the Minister for Transport. So you just need to be adapting based on those pieces of information. Um, in terms of conventions, so for a newspaper article, you might want to do a headline. Um, and then maybe a subheading and then get cracking into your paragraphs but you don't need to worry about making it actually look like a newspaper article so you don't need to be worrying about columns pictures putting captions on the pictures don't draw a picture in the exam just write um and the same goes for the rest of them um with a letter you might want to you would probably start with you could i'd say put an address in just make an address up really quickly on the right hand side of the paper and then put dear minister for transport and then i am writing to you to um, tell you my viewpoints on this and then get cracking essentially um, so use a little bit of genre convention don't go mad and don't worry about um, making it look right on the page you don't get any marks for presentation of your work essentially um, right i really apologize to um who's just messaging saying aren't we supposed to be doing maths so there's been an error on the timetabling i think um it was always going to be english today um and i'm not sure what's gone wrong i'm really sorry it's not um me who makes the timetables and puts them on the website so i apologize if you guys are here for maths and you've got me instead i really i'm really sorry <laughs> so um right so we talked about tone style and register in that uh in the assessment objective so what i would like you guys to do for me please is i would like you to tell me which one matches up to each so it's fallen off the bottom here so the attitude of a writer towards the topic they are writing about so we've got tone style and register Hi Azima, right okay so how long should the writing be uh, referring to the amount of time? Um, so I'm going to run through um, each one and how long you've got. So at the moment we're still on question five and we're on 45 minutes. So you've got five minutes to plan, five minutes to proofread at the end and 35 minutes to write. Um, so you've got 45 minutes in total for this. Right so which one matches up to which? So tone third um the attitude towards the attitude of the writer towards a topic yes yeah, so that's tone style is the formality no it's not so uh register is the formality or colloquialism of a text so register means how informally or informally you're writing um so if i was um sort of just texting my mum i would be relatively informal um i might not use punctuation i might not use capital letters where they're supposed to be but if i was writing a newspaper article i would make sure that it's quite formal um that all my spelling punctuation and grammar is in the right place essentially and uh style is the uh manner of expression suitable for the format you are writing in um so that would just be um the, we looked at the difference between tabloids and broadsheets so if you're writing a letter to the Minister of Transport, the style you're writing is going to be very respectful. Um, it's going to be uh, using a lot of uh, long words. It's going to be really well-rounded. Whereas if you're writing perhaps for a tabloid, it would be quite chatty. Uh, you'd have smaller paragraphs. You'd sort of be building more of a rapport with the audience. That uh, sort of thing. Right. Okay. So that's cleared up. So potential structural and grammatical features. So these are a few things that you could potentially do in your writing just to get that really top end mark for the grammatical and structural features. So you could use changing tense. 
So you could perhaps do that via an anecdote. Um, so you could be writing in present tense and saying, this is how I feel. I think this because, and then I think this. Um, I think this because of what happened a few years ago and then tell that anecdote in past tense. Uh, using a variety of clauses, so main subordinate, I'm gonna quickly recap that for you in a minute. Uh, a variety of paragraph and sentence lengths. So make sure you've got, you could have a short snappy paragraph to start off with and then have some longer ones and then a short one to sign off. Um, or you could have a short one in the middle for impact sentence lengths. Make sure you've got some shorts. So simple, compound and complex, have a nice mixture of them in there. Um, and make sure that you're using them for the right impact in the right place. And starting sentences in a variety of ways. So for example, fronted adverbials, um, which I'm going to show you as well. So main clause is just a clause that can stand by itself and makes, makes sense. Um, so I walk to my house, that's a main clause. It's a simple main clause. It's not very exciting. Yeah. Subordinate is um, adding in extra information which cannot stand by itself. Um, so if I draw a line here and split this sentence, so we've got the main and subordinate clause. I walk to my house, it's a main clause, it makes sense by itself. And then which took me a long time, that doesn't make sense by itself. So I do, generally you will probably use a lot of subordinate clauses without even realise that you're doing it but be aware that you get marks for that. So that's that. Um, and fronted adverbials, so starting a sentence with an adverb. So despite is the adverb there, despite it being a miserable day, I walked to my house. So again, this is, this is a subordinate clause, which has been moved to the front and it starts with an adverb. So you could say, I walked to my house despite it being a miserable day. That works slightly less it's not quite as punchy as it so despite it being a miserable day and then you're thinking oh what have I done because it because we've still got this miserable day going on yet there's a sense of intrigue where if you say I walked to my house despite it being a miserable day it's not quite as interesting because you're not sure what the main clause there's no sort of you don't know what the main clause is you've already been told it so that is that right Um, we are not doing a text today. I'm just going to run through the topics um, and sort of give you some advice. I'm going to run through some resources as well that you guys can go and look at. Right. Uh, did you, which slide did you want to email? Was it um, that one? And then the other page that I've just got there is how is your planning essentially. Um, so let me just check Q&A. I haven't missed anything. Fabulous. Right, I'm going to move on, but I will come back to it later, Zima, if you want me to. Um, right, so in terms of organising your ideas, you can plan in whatever way you want to. Whatever works for you, essentially. Um, so I would just say before you get going, make sure you organise your ideas in some way. So this is how I would do it personally. I would probably start off with some bullet points or a spider diagram or something like that. And then I would perhaps label each one. So point one, I put next to one idea, then point two, point three, and then have some idea of um, where I'm starting when I'm finishing. But I wouldn't spend lots of time filling this in and making it look beautiful. I'd do it very scrappily and then get on because you've only got five minutes. The other thing I suggest you guys do is you write down um, all of the DeForest features or any of the stretch and challenge ones that I've come up with or anything else you can think of when you go into the exam because it works really nicely um, for a success criteria for your question five so you can sort of tick off as you go along for each one that you've done and um, which is what I do when I'm writing stuff for you guys I tick as I go um, and it's really nice for your questions three and you can talk about them a little bit for questions two and four they're not really the main focus but you could mention them so if you're a little bit stuck you can go back to those and go right okay which one of the, these can I find in this text and then you can go talk about it so if your mind goes blank that's a nice place to start I think right question four so you've got five minutes planning for this one and 15 minutes to actually write. So you're comparing ideas and perspectives um, and you are, when it says across two or more texts, don't worry about that, you will just get two texts. Um, so you are looking at the whole of source A and B um, and you will be told either compare how the writer conveys 
uh, similar or different perspectives. So this one was a little bit different because usually they'd had different perspectives before. Um, but you can say they do this similarly, but they are different because they do it in different ways. They present the ideas in different ways. Um, and you will always be given three bullet points as well. Um, so in terms of organising your ideas, you've got five minutes to plan. Um, hi, yeah, no, there is a quiz at the end. So we just did a quick true or false at the beginning um, to sort of look at some misconceptions. And I've got sort of like a revision big quiz at the end, essentially on Kahoot. Why well, I say big, it's about 15 questions. Right, so organising your comparison points quickly. Um, what I would say definitely do, um, whether you do this at the, I'd say at the start of your um, written questions, so your questions two, three and four, work out what the purpose, audience and format is for both of the texts, because that will stand you in good stead and you can understand why they're doing things based on those. Um, highlight, I would, you, you can take highlighters into the exam, and to be honest with you, I would take as many different colours as I could take. And um, I would sort of highlight things as I go along because um, that really works for me because I'm really visual. Um, you might want to do a Venn diagram if you're really stuck and you want things quite visually in front of you if, instead of writing down some bullet points and annotating. Um, and also um, apply any context knowledge you know. So if there is a similarity or a difference of opinions, um, can we link context to that? And if so, how, what context is important there? Um, so that is that. Um, so in terms of what the bullet points mean, so compare the similar perspectives on cycling. So for that, you need to be looking for opinions. Are they the same or different? If they are the same, are they conveyed differently? So you could talk about implicit, explicit, subjective, objective, any deforest features. And what I would do is I would highlight in yellow for that one so i'd highlight that bullet point in yellow and then i would highlight um, anything that i felt fitted into that category in yellow so i could immediately see all my pieces of evidence on the page um, compare the methods the writers use to convey their perspectives so i would highlight that one in blue and then i would look for um so methods can be literally deforest features uh, implicit, explicit, anything like that, um, credibility, generalisation, any of that, doesn't matter, it can be anything at all. Um, why are they doing that? Why are they choosing that method is what you need to be asking yourself. Um, and you could also, which I think is quite a high level thing to do, is which one has more credibility and validity? So which one has the most evidence essentially? Which one do you think um, is the most persuasive because of uh, the amount of data that they've collected together. It could be in the form of anecdotes, uh, experts, uh, statistics, facts, that sort of thing, or is it just someone's opinion and observations? And possibly thinking about the tone as well. Is one positive and one negative? Are they both positives? Are they what we call discursive? So do they look at both sides of the argument? So a whole variety of things you can do with that bullet point. And the one at the bottom is support your response with reference to the text. So that is essentially just use good evidence. Right, question three. So question three, you will be told to look at one source. It could be either of the sources. And I've come across in papers where one exam paper you've got source a is the old text and in some it's source b the source is the um old text so there's no be careful essentially that you don't assume that source a is going to be the older one just make sure you'll be told to focus on around 10 12 lines and you'll be asked how the writer uses language to describe and then whatever the subject matter is um, so it's very, very similar to paper one, question two, in that, um, oh, you can look at structure. Oh, no, hold on. You can't look at structure. So AO2, AO2 is used for paper one. So you get the same assessment to check objectives over. So for question two on paper one, this is the same, but you can't look at structure. So this is sort of... Um, an umbrella term so even though it says that's your assessment objective and it talks about structure um you you can't in this question so it's just so you can make it applicable to 
uh, paper one, question two, and question three, and this question. So you can look at language. So it's the same um, as paper one, question two. It's the same bullet points, only the bullet points aren't there for this one. So it's a slightly mean question again. So you can talk about words and phrases, language features and techniques, um, and you can talk about sentence forms. So it's the same thing, just imagine the bullet points are there, but they're not written on the page. Hence why I think this paper is slightly meaner than the first one. Um, so for that, use any of your DeForest features, talk about any of those, that's absolutely fine. And if you stretch and challenge, you can talk about any of these which we've mentioned before. Um, if there's any of those on there that you can't remember what they are and you want me to go over again quickly, uh, speak now or forever, hold your peace. Um, right okay i appreciate that i'm whizzing through these right okay and the re other really important thing to say is make sure that you choose a quotation you have a lot to say about so sometimes when we've been analyzing text you guys have said oh this is alliteration and you're right it is alliteration so for example i think somebody said public profile is alliteration you're right it is alliteration but is it there int intentionally probably not that's just what we call it it's um can you actually say anything interesting about public profile as a piece of alliteration no so make sure that you use quotations that you have a lot to say about so i've chosen embarrass hurt or distress so these both came from the disability article that we looked at and that was in reference uh to i can't remember is it lucy hawking stephen hawking's daughter uh, talking about her son who is autistic so talking about that rule of three and you can talk about sort of the background behind it apply the context to it um, you can say much more about that than you can public profile is the point I'm trying to say okay question two so a one this time so you are identifying and interpreting explicit and implicit information and you are synthesizing evidence from the text so synthesizing essentially means uh, making it compact making it smaller summarizing essentially um, so you've got the entirety of both texts to look at here i think it's really mean you've got both texts to look at for only eight marks it's a lot of legwork i think it's the trickiest question on here just because there's so much um you've got to read through and sift in the time you've got oh i haven't put the timing up on that one let's whiz back why are you saying it's undefined <gasps> it's going to be one of those days i think guys right so Hopefully that will sort itself out. So question two, we are looking at eight minutes for that. So a minute a mark, that's real good going, isn't it? So you want to be using some of that reading and planning time to, to look at that. And what I suggest you guys do is you read all the questions before you actually start reading the texts. So as you are looking, uh, you are sort of coming up with some ideas and you can highlight little bits as you go. So you're interactively reading. Oh, don't tell me that it's not working. That's not helpful in the slightest. Right, let's see if uploading it again will sort it out. Bias. Right, okay, Addison. So bias is uh, when you have an opinion and you are swayed by a particular factor. So, for example, if I said... Um, Yorkshire Terriers are the best dogs in the world. They're the best breed that, that you can possibly get. I would be biased because I have a Yorkie. Um, right. Oh, that sort of sorted it out. But things are overlapping. Right. So, again, I'm a big fan of um, highlighters. So for this, you could you could do a Venn diagram, but just be wary and don't spend loads of time on it um, because you just don't have the time a minute a mark. And a minute a mark is really tricky for English. Um, what I would do is I would highlight. So I would have colour code for implicit. So I'll highlight in orange implicit and anything in explicit in green. And then it's really easy for me to see. And I make sure that I use a colour code. So I'd highlight the word implicit in the question. Um, oh, it doesn't say it. So I'd write implicit down, highlight it in red, explicit, highlight it in green and then get going. 
and I'd write those on my insert so I didn't get confused. Right, quick recap of implicit and explicit. So implicit is something that is implied but you're not directly told. Um, so we get loads of that. We'll go, have a look at some examples later. Explicit, something which you're directly told. You can also consider objective and subjective as well. They're very, very similar. Right. Is bias the word the same as a language feature bias? Yeah, so it's, a, it's essentially a language feature. Yeah. Um, right, your question one. So you've got five minutes for this, which I think is relatively generous. Um, so you'll be given eight statements, four of which are true. You've got to um, work out which four are true. So the AO one is you are just, it's the same. You are synthesizing evidence and you are interpreting explicit and implicit information. Um, you only have one source to look at and you have a small area to look at. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of you did this quicker than five minutes. Um, because I think five minutes is generally quite generous in terms of some of the other timings in this exam. Right. So that's essentially your timings and what you need to be doing for each question. Um, resources for context. So I know I've been banging you over the head with yep yeah, and we're doing a quiz um, in a few moments. Don't worry, we're cahooting. It will all be okay. So uh, resources in terms of context, I've been absolutely battering you over the head with context and the importance of it. It's not the end of the world if you don't know a lot about context, but if you are aiming for, I'd say seven to nine grades, then knowing a little bit of context is good. So you'll be looking at a Victorian England text um, in the exam. Most of you are probably studying Christmas Carol or Jekyll and Hyde. So you'll probably have some really good knowledge in terms of context there already because we cover that a lot. Um, context is really important. Um, these are a few bits and pieces I have found. Um, so the podcasts, I found all of them just on my podcast app, which I have on iPhone, but I'm sure you can find stuff through Spotify or various other podcasting apps. And they're, all of these resources are free. Um, so I haven't listened to any of them but I've sort of had a scroll through as to the sorts of things that they have on there. Um, so you probably want to be selective. Um, some of these, there are sort of maybe one or two podcasts. Some of them are relatively new. Um, so there might be the odd thing on there, which you think, oh, that is completely irrelevant. Don't go listen to all of them. Just cherry pick what you think might be um, helpful. I'm just grabbing my phone to tell you what's on homeschool history because that's a new one. Um, so there's stuff like um, Pocahontas, Battle of Hastings, Florence Nightingale, Mansa Musa. Um, so there aren't a lot on there. There's one on Charles Dickens, so that might be a really good one to look at. Um, and I thought maybe the one on Florence Nightingale might be quite useful in terms of understanding the Crimean War, particularly if you're doing Charge of the Light Brigade. Um, so there's a couple on there. Um, history extra podcast i can't remember what is on that one i'll quickly look um age of victoria podcast again sort of looked okay um but i don't think there was very many on there um your dead to me podcast which is the one i was telling you about last week um there's the odd few bits on there which look okay which might be helpful uh life uh victorian times full documentary that is on youtube um, the person narrating is quite monotonous, so uh, you might find that difficult <laughs> to stay interested in, but there's some good stuff in there. And there's BBC Bite Size Victorian Era, there's just some facts, and I think there's a few videos on there as well. Um, right, History Extra podcast, there's, um, I think just generally, there might be some stuff on here which is helpful for your history. There's um, everything you, want, you ever wanted to know about Nazi Germany, but were afraid to ask, which sounds quite interesting um there's one about chaucer if you guys are interested in doing english literature a level that might be a good one to look at um there are what else is there that is useful ah this is why i put it on living on the edge in victorian britain um so that's probably the podcast the episode to go look at um 
there's some there's one on Florence Nightingale, there's Vikings, uh medieval stuff, there's all sorts of stuff on there that might be helpful for your history if you're doing history. Um, but there's the odd few podcasts dotted uh, episodes in those podcasts that sort of might be relevant. Right, so let me just double check what you guys have asked. Um, oh, I will get the language timing sheet up for you. Yep. Um, is it linked to history quite a lot? Not massively. Don't worry about sort of going swallowing a book. But if you know, just sort of like a little bit. Um, so maybe go listen to a podcast or if you're really into history, maybe go listen to two or three. Um, I think it's helpful. Um, right. If you know context for the poems for English language, would you get more points or would you get more points for knowing context? Right. If you know context for the poet, right, so knowing you, you are expected to know context for any of the scene um, stuff on the English literature page, if that is what you're asking. Right, me at 11.45, I love it when you guys quote me like this, it's really, really helpful. <laughs> right, so if you know context for the poems for English literature, would you get more points or would you not get more points for known context? I've no idea. Right, I haven't said that. So, um, if you know if you know a little bit of context, it stands you in good stead, and it will help you um, be able to um, understand implicit information. That's what I'm trying to say. So, if you want to go and do that, then these are the places to go and do it. If you don't, that's fine. Um, AO3, right, so you guys are getting a little bit confused with English language and English literature. So English language papers, <laughs> which is what we are looking at, um, English language paper, there isn't marks specifically for context, um, but there are marks for understanding implicit and explicit information. And if you can link the implicit and explicit information to context, then that will help your answer make it a more sturdy answer and it will show off to the examiner. In English literature, you are expected to know context and there are marks specifically designated for context. That is the difference. Most of the context, so you will be looking at a 19th century text in your English literature because you have to. Um, so you can probably, by most part, bring most of that context over into um, the questions where potentially applying context might be helpful that's the point i'm trying to get across right okay so i will ignore that because that was just in case i didn't have enough time right what i will do is i will stick the coot on and whilst we are playing i will suggest a few places to go and look for some extra resources And also to the person who keeps asking me um, what my opinions are on Black Lives Matter. My opinion is that, of course, Black Lives Matter and what is going on is completely justified and I fully support the movement. However, it is nothing to do with what we are doing today. So I am not answering any other questions. Oh, right, okay, Emma. So, when I copied the question, it changed, right, so, changed literature to language. So, I meant to say, my friend's got lots of points for context and he got a nine for it when somebody else got an eight for not using his point. So, I was wondering, do you get lots of points in context? So, yeah, in literature, you get points for context. There is an assessment objective for context. So, it's, it, context is much more important in English literature for the text that you've studied, because obviously you will spend time on the literature context side of it. Um, but knowing the odd little bit of context um, is really good for pushing your marks um, up and um, it'll give you a little bit more um, to play with essentially in your analysis. So don't worry about it too much, but if you are sort of really aiming for those top, top end grades and um, just sort of knowing a little bit more don't go off and do any work and any research, but perhaps listen to a podcast or a documentary.
essentially and what i've put up an ideas for you guys right i'm going to start just because i'm aware we've only got 10 minutes and there's quite a few questions right so some of these are true or false some of these are um multiple choice fabulous I'm hoping we might rattle through these today just so I can show you a few websites um, also if you guys have got any questions um, anything that you want me to go back to anything that you're concerned about um, please let me know in the last few minutes um, Tilly's just popped back um, and joined us so if you've got any questions about the online school then um, pop those in until he can answer this for you. Right, so bias is when you look at something objectively. So objectively is a fact. So, and if you're biased towards something, that means that you're being subjective. Essentially, you're not looking at the bigger picture. Yeah, so jargon is sort of a specific set of vocabulary. So, for example, in medicine, like stuff like sort of medical names for bones. Um, medical equipment, uh, the names of medicines, that sort of thing, that would all be jargon. Fabulous. Everyone seemed to do really well on that one. Brilliant. Fabulous. Right. Good stuff. Apologies for rushing this a little bit, guys. I want to show you a few websites that might be helpful for you before we finish. Fabulous. This is all looking very good so far. Fabulous. Yeah, that's an opinion, not a fact. Brilliant. Guys getting really good at this. Ooh. You know what? I didn't even process what was going on on that question. You might well be right. I will double check at the end if I've got time. Lovely stuff. This seems to be going really well with the uh, feature spotting. Brilliant. Yeah, so that because there isn't actually a number in there, um, it makes it a fact rather than a statistic.
Yeah, that one could provide credibility, but yeah, so facts provide credibility essentially, but I'm more focusing on fact versus opinion and versus statistic. So you are right in that that is correct. Yeah, fab. Brilliant. Lovely. Last one then, and I'll quickly whiz through some resources for you and then we'll finish off. Fab. Right, let's see then who's on top of the podium. Sky at three, Slinky at two, and Sedge at the top. Fantastic. Right, okay. Just a few resources then for you guys. So um, generally, um, AQA's website I think is quite good in terms of you've got all the papers with the mark schemes and the inserts. There's the odd one which the insert isn't published for copyright reasons, but you can usually find a school who's uploaded it to their website um, to get around that. Um, and there's the examiner report, which is really written for teachers, but you could read that and see sort of that. It tells you what students did well and what they didn't do well. Um, so that might help you in understanding the questions a little bit more if you wanted to sort of be a little bit more geeky with how uh, it all works. Um, this is Save My Exam. So this is a pay paid platform. It's not just English. Um, so, whoops, what have I done? So GCSE, so there's Mass, Chemistry, Biology, Physics. Um, and if I just clicked on the science ones there, and there's loads of different exam boards. Um, and they've also got um, English language and literature um there as well so that's a really good place to look for um but that is paid um mr bruff um so he has a shop um it's really he does um sort of modern day translations of all of the shakespeare plays so if you're struggling with language um he might be a good uh sort of book to go by um and he does loads of free videos on youtube as well which is really handy um tez so this again is mainly for teachers but you will find the odd sort of revision resources on there so if you just search for something that you're sort of looking for a little bit of help with you might find something useful might not um same with twinkle there's some revision guides um on there but that is paid and it's mainly focusing on primary school but there is key stage three four and five stuff on there um and the last one is exam ninjas so i mm, let's get rid of that so I think most of this is free. I might be wrong. Um, it's a long time. I oh, know it's not. There's stuff at the bottom. There might be the odd thing that is free in there. So that might be a good place to look as well. Fabulous. Right. I don't think um, we've got any other questions. I don't think we've had any sort of um, my tutor based ones come in. Um, Tilly, have you found anything um, that you would like to comment on um, that I haven't spotted? No, not that I can see. Fab. Right. Okay. I would say goodbye then, everyone. So I will see you all on Thursday. We're doing Checking Out My History by John Agard. Absolutely fantastic and um, sort of very poignant for the um, Black Lives Matter movement going on at the moment. So hopefully we'll get some um, really uh, good understanding um, from that poem. John Agard's absolutely fantastic. So I will see you all on Thursday um, and I will. Um, be doing checking out my history and I'll be doing 
Unseen Poetry on Friday. If you guys are interested in one-to-one -one tuition, go have a look on our website. And as always, all lessons are recorded and they are uploaded to YouTube so you can go watch them again if you want to. Right, have a fantastic day and I will see you all on Thursday.